Welcome to Learning English from the Voice of America. I'm Katie Weaver. This program of news and stories from around the world is designed for people learning English. Today, we hear from Brian Lynn, Alice Bryan, and Kelly Jean Kelly. We close the show with part one of the American story, William Wilson by Edgar Allan Poe. But first, the Me Too movement against sexual abuse began one year ago. At first, it largely centered on professional women speaking out in Hollywood and in the fields of media and politics. But a $22 million legal fund has helped give women at all economic levels a chance to bring sexual harassment cases against employers. Women in the entertainment industry began the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund in January. It followed accusations of sexual wrongdoing against powerful men in Hollywood. Those accusations also led to the rise of hashtag MeToo. In the months since the fund was launched, more than 780 lawyers have registered with the group to provide legal help. More than 3,500 people have asked for help. 40% of them are women of color. Two-thirds are poor or near poor. The women come from many different industries, including building, food services, education, and the military. Fatima Gas Graves is president of the National Women's Law Center, which administers the fund. She told the Associated Press, We've helped people bring cases they could not have brought otherwise. She said, We can make it a reality that no matter where you work, you can work safely and with dignity. Saturnina Placencia is one of the women seeking assistance from the Time's Up Fund. She is a 43-year-old single mother of three girls, including a newborn. Placencia works at a store in Brooklyn, New York. She says she has dealt with repeated sexual harassment from her employer. She says he decreased her work hours when she refused his requests for dates. Placentia said the situation worsened in early February when she told her boss that she was pregnant. She reports he said, the baby could have been mine and then reduced her work time to just 12 hours a week. Placentia left her job and has been unemployed ever since. Placentia said she knows of other workers who were sexually harassed at the store but were too afraid to take action. I used to put up with everything, Placentia said. Now I say, don't be scared. Speak up. In May, five women brought a case against the Chicago Fire Department. All are emergency medical workers. All have decided to not tell their names to try to protect their jobs. The women accuse a co-worker and several supervisors of sexual harassment. They also report that the fire department's unofficial policy of silence protected the harassers. Amy Kramer is one of the women's lawyers. 
She said the Time's Up Fund agreed in July to support the lawsuit. One of the women is accusing a chief of seeking a sexual relationship with her and repeatedly sending her sexual text messages. Another woman says a firefighter stalked her, following her and watching her in a threatening way. Three of the women say a supervisor made repeated sexual comments to them. The women have several demands, including the establishment of fire department policies to fight sexual harassment. The fire department has not said what steps it might take in answer to the lawsuit. Katie Armager signed her first record deal at age 15. She had a top 10 album by the time she was 20. Now she says she is being punished for speaking out about sexual harassment in the country music industry. She faces a lawsuit from her former recording label, Cold River Records. They say her comments violated part of an agreement she signed with Cold River. The agreement bars Armager from making negative comments about the company. The Time's Up Fund is helping Armager fight back. They are providing money for her defense costs and for her own lawsuit against the company. Armager's suit says agreements like the one she signed should not be enforced. It says the secrecy they demand is harmful to the public. The singer's lawyer, Alex Little, said the case may go on for months and could be very costly. He said the fund's support will help his team to find expert witnesses to help make the strongest possible arguments. Armager is now 27 years old and trying to restart her career. She has met with several other music publishing companies in Nashville, Tennessee. None have offered her a deal. She says they are too scared too hesitant to work with me. The Nobel Peace Prize was awarded Friday to Congolese doctor Dennis McQuaggy and Yazidi activist Nadia Murad. The two were honored for their work against the use of sexual violence as a weapon of war. The Norwegian Nobel Committee said they have made a crucial contribution to focusing attention on and combating such war crimes. The committee noted that Dennis McQuaggy is the helper who has devoted his life to defending these victims. Nadia Murad is the witness who tells of the abuses perpetrated against herself and others. McQuaggy founded a hospital in eastern Congo's city of Bukavu and has treated thousands of victims of sexual violence. Armed men tried to kill him in 2012, forcing him to temporarily leave the country. McQuaggy was in the operation room when he was told the news of his award. He said, I can see in the faces of many women how they are happy to be recognized. Nadia Murad 
is a human rights activist who, in the words of the committee, has shown uncommon courage in speaking up. When she was 21, Islamic State militants attacked her village in northern Iraq, and she was forced into sexual slavery. She is one of an estimated 3,000 Yazidi women who were victims of rape and other abuses by the Islamic State militants. She escaped after three months with the help of a Muslim family. Murad wrote The Last Girl to tell the story of her capture, the loss of her family, and her escape. At some point, there was rape and nothing else. This becomes your normal day, she wrote. After the award was announced, Murad's brother told Norwegian public broadcaster NRK, she's crying right now. She's crying. She can't talk. Barrett Rice Anderson is chairwoman of the Nobel Committee. She said, we want to send a message that women who constitute half the population in those communities actually are used as weapons and that they need protection and that the perpetrators have to be prosecuted and held responsible. Congo's opposition leader Felix Chisakedi said, I am proud to be Congolese. He also wrote on Twitter, good done for others always ends up being rewarded. In Iraq, state TV stopped regular programming to report on Murad's win. Iraqi Prime Minister Haider al-Abadi congratulated her on the award, and a Yazidi member of Iraq's parliament said, it is the victory of good and peace over the forces of darkness. Both honorees are the first from their countries to receive a Nobel Prize. The 2018 prize is worth 9 million Swedish kroner, about $1.01 million. Last year's winner was the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly. Have you ever wanted to ask someone in English about the kind of work they do, but were unsure how? Many cultures have ways of doing this. Today on Ask a Teacher, our question comes from Azra in Turkey. Is it polite to ask people about their jobs? How can I ask someone without sounding impolite? Hello, Azra, and thanks for writing to us. In the United States, asking someone about their job is one of the most common things to do when meeting that person for the first time. But in some other cultures, this question may be considered disrespectful, so be careful. Although questions such as what is your job and what are you seem like the most direct ways to ask, we do not use them. The questions are structured correctly, but to Americans they can sound impolite and unnatural. Instead, we have a few ways to ask that sound more natural. When you meet someone in a social situation and you want to know what kind of work they do, the most common question is this, what do you do? It is a shorter way of asking, what do you do for a living? 
Listen to both questions and some answers you might hear. Pay close attention to the pronunciation of what do you do, as it usually sounds like, what do you do, when said quickly. What do you do? I'm a teacher. What do you do for a living? I work in photojournalism. What do you do? I run an arts program for teenagers. What do you do for a living? I'm a musician. Compare the question, what do you do, to what are you doing? They sound similar, but the second is not work-related. It is asking what the person is doing right now, this minute. Two other friendly ways to ask someone about their work are, what kind of work do you do? And, what line of work are you in? You can answer in the same way, saying something like, I run an arts program for teenagers, or I'm a musician. After the person answers the question, it is a good idea to ask one or two more questions. Listen to an example. What do you do for a living? I run an arts program for teenagers. Nice. How long have you been doing that? For about five years now. Where do you work? At the city's Arts and Culture Division. Despite how common job-related questions are in social situations in the U.S., situations differ. Some people may find these questions too personal if asked too soon. If you're ever unsure, you can start a conversation in other ways, such as asking what the person does for fun in that city. Or you can comment on something interesting or funny at the event or activity. You should avoid the questions, what is your profession? and what is your occupation. They sound too official, so we do not use them in friendly situations. You would probably only hear them during a job interview or in an office environment. Another thing to know is that in American culture, we do not ask about a person's wages. Even some close friends and relatives do not discuss this subject. So, unless someone shares this information with you or asks for wage advice, avoid asking this question. And that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Alice Bryant. William Wilson, Part 1 Let me call myself for the present. William Wilson. That is not my real name. That name has already been the cause of the horror, of the anger of my family. Have not the winds carried my name with my loss of honor to the ends of the earth? Am I not forever dead to the world, to its honors, to its flowers, to its golden hopes? And the cloud, heavy and endless, does it not hang forever between my hopes and my heaven? Men usually become bad by degrees, but I let all goodness fall from me in a single moment, as if I had dropped a coat. From small acts of darkness I passed in one great step into the blackest evil ever known. Listen while I tell you of the cause that made this happen. Death is near, and its coming has softened my spirit. I desire in passing through this dark valley the understanding of other men. I wish them to believe that 
I have been in some ways in the power of forces beyond human control. I wish them to find for me in the story I'm about to tell some small fact that proves I could only have done what I did. I would have them agree that what happened to me never happened to other men. Is it not true that no one has ever suffered as I do? Have I not indeed been living in a dream? And am I not now dying from the horror and the unanswered question? The mystery of the wildest dream ever dreamed on earth. I am one of a family well known for their busy minds. As a small child, I showed clearly that I, too, had the family character. As I became older, it grew more powerful in me. For many reasons, it became a cause of talk among friends, and the hurt it did me was great. I wanted people always to do things my way. I acted like a fool. I let my desires control me. My father and mother, weak in body and mind, could do little to hold me back. When their efforts failed, of course, my will grew stronger. And from then on, my voice in the house was law. At an age when few children are allowed to be free, I was left to be guided by my own desires. I became the master of my own actions. I remember my first school. It was in a large house, about three hundred years old, in a small town in England, among a great number of big trees. All of the houses there were very old. In truth, it was a dreamlike and spirit-quieting place, that old town. At this moment I seem to feel the pleasant coolness under the shade of the trees. I remember the sweetness of the flowers. I hear again with delight, I cannot explain, the deep sound of the church bell each hour breaking the stillness of the day. It gives me pleasure to think about this school, as much pleasure perhaps as I am now able to experience. Deep in suffering as I am, suffering only too real, perhaps no one will object if for a short time I forget my troubles and tell a little about this period. Moreover, the period and place are important. It was then and there that I first saw hanging over me the terrible promise of things to come. Ah, oh, let me remember... The house where we boys lived and went to school was, as I have said, old and wide. The grounds about it were large, and there was a high wall around the outside of the whole school. Beyond this wall we went three times in each week, on one day to take short walks in the neighboring fields, and two times on Sunday to go to church. This was the one church in the village, and the head teacher of our school was also the head of the church. With a spirit of deep wonder and of doubt, I used to watch him there. This man with slow step and quiet, thoughtful face, in clothes so different and shining clean. Could this be the same man who, with a hard face and clothes far from clean, stood ready to strike us if we did not follow the rules of the school? Oh, great and terrible question, beyond my small power to answer. I well remember our playground, which was behind the house. There were no trees, and the ground was as hard as stone. In front of the house there was a small garden, but we stepped into this garden only at very special times, such as when we first arrived at school, or when we left it for the last time, or perhaps when father or mother or a friend came to take us away for a few days. But the house! 
What a delightful old building it was! To me, truly a palace! There was really no end to it. I was not always able to say certainly which of its two floors I happened to be on. From each room to every other there were always three or four steps either up or down. Then the rooms branched into each other, and these branches were too many to count, and often turned and came back upon themselves. Our ideas about the whole great house were not very far different from the thoughts we had about time without end. During the five years I was there, I could never have told anyone how to find the little room where I and some eighteen or twenty other boys slept. The schoolroom was the largest room in the house, and I couldn't help thinking it was the largest in the world. It was long and low, with pointed windows and heavy wood overhead. In a far corner was the office of our head teacher, Mr. Pransby. This office had a thick door, and we would rather have died than open it when he was not there. Inside the thick walls of this old school, I passed my years from ten to fifteen. Yet I always found it interesting. A child's mind does not need the outside world. In the quiet school I found more bright pleasure than I found later as a young man in riches or as an older man in wrongdoing. Yet I must have been different indeed from most boys. Few men remember much of their early life. My early days stand out as clear and plain as if they'd been cut in gold. In truth, the hotness of my character and my desire to lead and command soon separated me from the others. Slowly I gained control over all who were not greatly older than myself. Over all, except one. This exception was a boy who, though not of my family, had the same name as my own, William Wilson. This boy was the only one who ever dared to say he did not believe all that I told him, and who would not follow my commands. This troubled me greatly. I tried to make the others think that I didn't care. The truth was that I felt afraid of him. I had to fight to appear equal with him, but he easily kept himself equal with me. Yet no one else felt, as I did, that this proved him the better of the two. Indeed, no one else saw the battle going on between us. All his attempts to stop me in what I wanted to do were made when no one else could see or hear us. He did not desire, as I did, to lead the other boys. He seemed only to want to hold me back, sometimes with wonder and always without pleasure. I saw that his manner seemed to show a kind of love for me. I did not feel thankful for this. I thought it meant only that he thought himself to be very fine indeed, better than me. Perhaps it was this love he showed for me, added to the fact that we had the same name and also that we had entered the school on the same day, which made people say that we were brothers. Wilson did not belong to my family even very distantly. But if we had been brothers, we would have been near to each other indeed, for I learned that we were both born on the 19th of January, 1809. This seemed a strange and wonderful thing. Tune in next week for part two of William Wilson by Edgar Allan Poe. That is our show today. For VOA Learning English, I'm Katie Weaver. Thanks for listening.